Welcome back to course 2D Tracking in 3DE4. After covering basic information and attributes about 2D points in 3D Equalizer 4, we continue and dive deeper into more advanced tools and techniques for tracking. We will cover topics like what to do in situations with varying brightness, rotating patterns, when features are visible just in parts of the shot, and much more. So, Fasten your seatbelts and be amazed what every artist can achieve using 3D Equalizer 4. We start with quite easily explained parameters in Attribute Editor. Like mentioned in part 1, this course focuses on 2D tracking parameters. So we leave out all those used when calculating the tracked point. Well, you might guess it, without a solid 2D track, all 3D parameters won't rescue your project anyway. Okay, we already covered parameters from identifier to direction, except hide from display area. This toggle button, also found directly in display area, does exactly what it tells us. It hides the currently selected tracking point from, well, display area. In projects with tons of points, it might be helpful to hide some points, for example those not being included in the calculation process. RGB weights defines the weighting of each color channel used for tracking. The order is red, green, blue and values range from 0 to 1. Especially with noisy footage it might be worth investigating if noise is particularly strong in a specific color channel and therefore reducing its weight. Blurring sets how much the pattern should be blurred during tracking. To reduce any errors caused by noisy footage, and on a per pixel basis every footage has some noise, a little blur is applied to smooth the pattern. Just to have some control about this, since in certain situations it might be helpful setting a higher blur or even disable it, here's the parameter for it. Okay, deep tracking defines how deep the 2D tracking engine is searching for a feature. If a feature is hard to track, increasing this parameter will include more information of the defined pattern for searching it in the current frame, resulting in eventually finding it and therefore tracking it. But this might drastically decrease its tracking performance. So feel free to play with this value before simply setting it to 1. Next parameter is used quite often when it comes to shots with changing brightness. Compensate luminance changes. Here we have a shot with a huge explosion changing the entire brightness of the scene. By default, compensate luminance changes is activated. And for good reason. 3D Force tracking engine is able to kind of ignore it and continue tracking. But to demonstrate the influence of this parameter, let's deactivate it and see what happens. Boom! Nothing happens! Tracking just stops or in other situations will make the point jump around. Even with the recently learned deep tracking, no chance. The luminance change is just too drastic to find the initial pattern in the bright frames. So, turn it back on and track again. Great! It tracks smoothly through the different brightness levels caused by the explosion. Even the tracking deviation bar indicated big differences with the dark orange colored bar. But still everything was within limits for an acceptable tracking quality. But are there situations where compensate luminance changes might be better turned off? Rarely, but especially in really dark shots this parameter leads to extremely enhancing noise in the footage which might cause tracking errors. So bottom line, if there is a dark and noisy shot and 2D point is acting unpleasantly, try turning off compensate luminance changes. Okay, let's say you are given this shot and have to track the water. A really nice shot. So let's try it. Place a point, maybe here. Then track. Oh well, or maybe just sell the computer and start selling yummy coconuts at the beach. But before, just try following interesting technique. 
Have a look at parameter reference pattern. This parameter defines which frame should be used as the pattern used for finding it in the current frame. Following options are provided. Previous frame, previous keyframe, first keyframe, explicit frame. By default, previous keyframe is selected, defining that any time a keyframe was set during tracking, the latest one before the current frame is used as pattern. But this clearly doesn't work here. Basically, three out of the four won't work. Let's figure out which one by having a closer look at the footage. The C is constantly moving, changing the waves and therefore their appearance. But they also change slowly and kind of morphs steadily from one form into the other. So there's a continuity going on, which sorts out all options, setting a single frame as pattern. The option that might work here is the one that takes multiple frames into account, or at least always the previous one to react to the slow, constant changes of the water. So, set reference pattern to previous frame. And start tracking again. Magic! The point tracks smoothly and when we zoom out, we also see that the point does not simply go with the current, but stays where it should be. Despite the changing pattern. Awesome! After this magic, how about some witchcraft? With good or reliable sequence STA. Let's try tracking the marker on the blue box. But with the pattern tracker. I know, I know, sounds silly. But there are people out there that would try this way and they need help as well. So create a pattern tracking point on the marker. Adjust its size a little bit, then track the point. And here it comes. Looks like the point is possessed by a demon. The pattern rotates around widely, but at least stays on the marker. What happened here? Have a look at the pattern. It's a round marker on a constantly blue background, so its pattern is exactly the same no matter how you rotate it. Naturally, this will confuse to the tracking engine a bit. But tracking still looks good. Does it? Just on the first look. Although it's not an entirely bad track, we can see that the point moves a little bit on the marker due to this issue. Let's fix it and create a second point for comparison. Place it as closely as possible on the first point. Then have a look at parameter Rotate Reference Pattern. This option defines if 2D Tracking Engine is allowed to rotate the pattern during tracking in order to find it. Usually a quite good option, but having a shot and pattern like here, try tracking it with deactivated rotation. Great, no weird rotation anymore. The tracker sticks perfectly on the feature. Zoom in for a closer look. And here we see, both tracking points are noticeably away from each other. So tracking with allowed rotation did cause a little error. Great, so keep in mind, if a pattern does not have a clear alignment and causes a scene issue, simply deactivate rotate reference pattern. Okay, one more example how to deal with rotating patterns. Here we have a drone shot of a desert and a tree in the middle. Camera is flying around it. The task is to solve the camera, so obviously we need to track features on the ground. During tracking we notice how good the tracking engine is able to find the initial pattern in the following frames by rotating the pattern more and more in each frame. But towards the end we also notice it gets wobblier and wobblier, although point seems to stick to its feature. Having a close look we can see that the point moves away very slightly. As seen the extreme rotation does influence tracking quality. The pattern is not perfectly flat, and therefore resulting in perspective changes during the rotation. The pattern in the beginning simply is not the same rotated pattern in the end. At the beginning we see a different side of this feature than in the end. An issue we already covered in part 1 of this course. It doesn't only happen if one side of a castle is not visible anymore, but also here on seemingly great patterns on a ground. 
Such ideal flat patterns are extremely rare in reality. So always keep this in mind when dealing with topics like rotation. So how can we improve it? Maybe more keyframes along the tracking curve will help avoiding such huge rotations, since rotation is zero again with every new keyframe. So what about parameter reference pattern, which we learned about tracking the waves a bit earlier? Here as well we have a slowly and constantly changing pattern situation. Not so far away from the moving waves. It doesn't work here. Unlike the constantly changing waves resulting in very different patterns over time. And of course, having such a transforming ground, this technique was kinda the only tracking option. But here, the pattern meaning the desert ground doesn't change that much. This results in the effect that each frame causes a little error which will be inherited by the following one. And the following one and the following one. You know, like going out for one single drink and suddenly, several shots later, the whole world is rotating. Who knows why? Oh great. With this bad joke, we can move on to the real solution, which is creating more keyframes, but in a different way. So, first approach is manually creating more keys. We keep the first point for a little comparison later. So, we won't mess with it. For that, here's a very handy tip. Lock curve, found in display area and menu edit. With this script, the 2D tracking curve can be locked to prevent any modifications. Just modifying tracking boxes can be done, but have no effect on the tracking curve. A nice helper also to visually define a point is done and finished. So create a new point as close as possible to the existing point. Or use a script for copying the first point. With added, transform 2D tracks we can apply various transformations on a 2D tracking point. Or use the script to simply duplicate it untransformed. There it is, perfectly placed upon each other. Since there's only one single keyframe on frame 1, deleting tracking curve until end can be done with clicking end point twice. Ok, so start tracking. And as soon the rotation gets quite high, stop and create a new keyframe with end point. Now continue. This process is an exact science, so it is hard to tell that a keyframe has to be set every 20th frame, for example. Trust your guts and place one whenever you think a pattern was transformed too much. Great. Now we can compare the results to the previous point. Most of the time they stay upon each other, except for the second half of the shot and especially in the end. Here it's clear that the first point has a slight tracking error. Nice. With this procedure we definitely could improve tracking quality. But it is not necessary to do this manually all the time. Again, lock the current point, then copy it. Change colors as well to distinguish it from the other two points. Then with the new one selected, activate parameter Create keyframe while tracking. Then start tracking. As we can see, 3D4 automatically creates keyframes when deviation gets too high. The result is very close to our manually keyframed point, even slightly better. And also much better than the white first point. To control the deviation limit and therefore a threshold for creating keyframes, slider sensitivity can be set to a lower or higher value. Try a higher value. And since rotation business is serious mean business, max out sensitivity. Let's not forget to clean the entire tracking curve. Then let's see what happens. See how unequally keyframes are placed throughout the shot and how many more were created compared to a sensitivity of 0.75. So now we have three points created in different ways. Looks like the last approach is the winner here. But as always, all these settings can react entirely different in other shots. So always be curious enough to play with them. Ok, on to the next shot. 
we're back on the flag. Like previously during corner tracking, let's try tracking the same blue corner with pattern tracker. Okay, create a new point. Adjust tracking boxes a bit. Then start tracking with default settings. And the pattern roller coaster continues. Normal people would now switch to edge corner tracker. Just kidding, of course. There's a way to track this feature with pattern tracker as well. As mentioned before, have a look at parameter scale reference pattern. Deactivating this option makes sense in this case because of two aspects. First, the camera stands still in front of the flag. Therefore, the corner does not change its size on screen throughout the shot. It just changes its appearance a bit due to the waves within the flag. Second, we only have this blue corner on a white background, making this pattern so-called scale invariant. Scaling cannot be determined precisely, like rotation on the white marker and blue box. So, let's try it with deactivated scale reference pattern. Awesome! Now our 2D point stays on the corner. Flawlessly. Alright, we know about a point's attributes and how to use them in a variety of situations. Especially playing with the reference pattern options can save or speed up a lot of tracking jobs. The next chapter is all about what to do if it is needed to track an invisible feature. More specifically, a feature that is hidden by an obstacle or whatever for a certain period in the shot. Let's say we like to track this feature on the wall. Search area box should be adjusted a bit. Then track. And here comes the monitor shamelessly hiding the precious feature. Look for the last correctly tracked frame. By the way, here again the effect of a visible motion vector is clearly visible. The frame before it jumps away from its original position is already indicated in this frame. So what to do now? The solution is called offset tracking. It is not only possible to move a tracking box around the tracking point, it is also possible to move it completely away from it, defining areas as patterns that are not exactly around the tracking point. This technique is applicable here since the camera moves quite parallelly to the wall and therefore keeps almost the same distance to the camera. The areas near the tracking point move similar on screen than the area of the tracking point itself, so providing a very similar 2D translation. We can use that and simply track the area slightly above the monitor. And as soon as the original feature is visible again, move the tracking box back upon the tracking point. A quick check. Looks good. Problem solved. Last, a quick tip about the now animated tracking box. As soon as a tracking box has different sizes or positions, these changes are interpolated between the keyframes, resulting in a nicely animated tracking box. In case a user dislikes it, simply turn off parameter spline tracking boxes. And we see the transformations only in these frames where they actually happen. We stay at creating tracking information where it seems impossible to extract them from footage. In certain tracking scenarios, it's incredibly hard to track features. For example, the camera moves so fast creating huge amounts of motion blur or tons of debris or people running around hiding features in most of the frames. Like here, 35 frames full of mayhem. We like to thank great VFX studio ETC London for providing this interesting shot, which is really challenging to track. A real example from the everyday life of a match moving artist. In these situations, every single tracked frame can be a lifesaver. Even if tracking accuracy won't be 100% for every single point, it might be enough giving us a solid working camera solve. This chapter covers three approaches and tools for such scenarios. Insert track, deform track, and overlay grids. Let's start tracking with a branch on the right side, possibly the feature with the longest visible frame range. But not entirely. Offset tracking isn't an option here, as we can see. 
too many people hiding everything. So let's continue tracking a point that can be seen in the last frames. Like this one a little more in the background. Start tracking it backwards from the last frame. And hooray! A few frames more can be tracked with offset tracking. Hoorays are pretty rare in these shots, so always be thankful for such moments. Great, we now have two points covering different frame ranges. How about combining them in a magic way? Having a closer look at the shot, we can see due to little camera movement, their 2D movement is quite similar. Even they are positioned in different Z position towards the camera. Usually it's recommended to avoid using tracking curves from features in different Z positions due to parallax. Well, these points basically will move completely different on screen, obviously. But this shot is a great example that all kinds of techniques and tricks should always be considered if they might be applicable in certain situations. Such complex tracking situations might require compromises between tracking quality and the possibility of solving a shot at all. And in this case, the differences of these two features are really small. So, welcome script, insert track, in menu, edit. With both points selected, scrub into the frame range where one of the points have no tracking data. Then run script, insert track. And boom, magic! The tracking curve of the upper point was inserted into the gap. Of course, it's not simply copied, but transformed so it fits into the target tracking curve. By the way, if this script is called when both points have tracking information, a new point is created with an average tracking curve. The result already looks really good, but there's still room for little improvement. Insert track works best if a tracking curve can be inserted between two keyframes. But how to create another keyframe here? We can guess it, or use the second track point as reference, with the overlay grid, found in menu, view. This tool gives us a nice grid covering entire display area. Have a look at the options. Snap grid to point snaps the grid to the selected point, making it easy to compare it to other features. This is exactly what we're doing here, with the help of the other functions in the menu for modifying the grid. Let's add more grid lines and rotate it until one cross section matches with the 2D point position. Okay, as mentioned a bit earlier, although there's very little parallax, in this shot the camera moves so little that 2D movement of both features is pretty similar and therefore we can use this technique here. Remember, always see which kind of shot allows which kind of technique. Now, place the selected tracking point in the last frame, with the help of Overlay Grid. Just a quick tip, to place a point more precisely than with a mouse, 3D4 has a nice little script for moving a point subpixel by subpixel. With a nudge tool found in menu Edit, or using their respective shortcuts, the arrow keys on the keyboard, it is possible to precisely move a point. Cool, now we have two keyframes. Select again both points, move to the untracked frame range, then again run script insert track. Awesome! The tracking curve is clearly a bit different and slightly improved towards the end. Good! As we can see, there might be the need for even more tracking points than there are available visible features. So, what about simply cloning an existing point and then moving its tracking curve to a new position? Sounds weird, but definitely a valid option in this shot. So, with our branch point selected, 
Open Tool Deform Track, either by button in Display Area or Menu Edit. Deform Track offers several functions to edit a 2D track. Let's directly use the important ones. For more detailed information, please have a look at Wolfgang Niedermeyer's Tech Talk article on 3dequalizer.com. The link to it is in the description. Since Deform Track writes information and feedback into Python console, let's quickly add one to Display Area. Okay, first and foremost, we need a copy of this tracking point. As done multiple times in this course, copy the currently selected point with script transform to dtracks. Now back to Deform Track. The tracking curve of the new point has to be cached with button buffer track. Good. Now we can modify the point's position to another feature. How about this white thingy on the branch? The entire tracking curve has to be adjusted to this new position with function deform track. Just awesome how tracking curve changed. Let's have a look at the track. Well, it's not that bad, but there's room for improvement. Luckily, this feature can be seen in some frames, so use this information to place it in these. It seems we have to align the point in the current frame manually with nudge tool, like done at overlay grid. Or, in contrast to previously, the feature is still visible and of course there's a script for that. A script that automatically aligns the point to the correct position. Align to key. Okay, what is this script for? It basically uses the 2D tracking engine to find the pattern in the current frame when placed already roughly in the area of the original pattern, defined in the last keyframe. Great! With a single click, the tracking point is perfectly aligned to its pattern. An extension of that script is Align Point to Reference Pattern, found in menu Tracking. This script does not automatically take the latest previous or next keyframe, but lets the user choose any keyframe on the entire tracking curve as reference. Sometimes a different keyframe simply fits better as reference. A feature's appearance on screen might change multiple times due to complex camera movements. So it's great having a tool to react to these situations. Now we can simply again run script deform track. There's no need to buffer any frame again since the original tracking curve is still cached. As we can see in Python console, the script now uses two keyframes for deforming. The result is already much better. But just because we can and we want to have another hooray moment, align the point in some more frames. It's a pretty fast workflow considering all the stuff that's going on in this shot. Okay. Deform track, and hooray, the point looks good. With all these tools and you see how great it is to combine different tools, it is possible to solve even the most complicated shots, simply with good 2D tracking. This chapter is all about marker tracking and a very useful tool called image controls, which can help manipulating an image to extract more information for a more accurate marker track. Okay, let's have a look at the shot. We see a green screen filled with markers and hey, a guy walks in, also covered with markers. Wow, truly an Oscar worthy performance. Not. However, the task here is quite common in the industry. Match moving. Track as many features on him as possible for a precise reconstruction of his movements. As we can see here, most markers will be quite easy to track with the basic techniques we already learned in the first chapters. But I know. You're here for the hard stuff, so let's go straight to a little more difficult marker. Like this one. Like always, create a marker tracking point. Adjust tracking boxes, gauge it, and track. Looks good. 
No, not really. At least not in every frame. Have a closer look. Around frame 370, the marker clearly slips away from its center. It seems the gauging process cannot find the true center of this marker. Although quite clear for our eyes, the color values on the right part of the blurred red marker are too different from the ones around the tracking point. So the gauging process doesn't recognize they belong together. Sounds like increasing the threshold is the way to go. So let's do this with the help of image controls. A nice tool for editing the image appearance, like contrast, saturation, gamma, blurring or sharpening and so on. The most interesting part in this demo is at top, chroma key. Enable image controls, then toggle button chroma key enabled. Nothing happened so far, since we did not set anything. Instead of a long theoretical introduction, best way to show its capabilities is to demo it. Activate button pick plus. Then click drag the mouse on the red marker. We instantly see a black and white mask was created only showing the red marker. We also see the mask does not cover the entire marker, pretty much just the area the gauging process is already recognizing. So expand it by click dragging again around the white area. Oh, too much. Although the entire marker is now masked. Let's fine tune the selection further and remove all white grain from the body with button pick minus. Better? To get rid of the remaining grain, play around with slider range to modify the virtual size of the chroma key color samples in color space. Nice. To finish fine tuning, Blur the image to get a smoother border. Currently it's really noisy and smooth footage definitely helps the 2D tracking engine. Last step is including the color range of these smaller red markers as well. So add these color samples. By the way, in case wrong samples were added or removed, simply undo the latest actions. It's already visible that the tracking point is a bit away from the tracking marker's true center. So on to its first frame. Gauge the point again. Looks much better now. Then simply start tracking. Oh, and we see apparently a few frames down the road the marker gets black holes, indicating that through different lighting or a reflection different color samples appear on it. This is not very unusual, so keep an eye on the marker mask. To fix it, just add these samples. And we get a closed solid marker mask. Great! Looks like everything went well this time. Check tracking quality with disabled image controls. Yes! Really great! Image controls is a very powerful tool to help with all kinds of tracking tasks. Not only at marker tracking. Feel free to play around it whenever a feature seems hard to track due to a too dark, bright or grainy footage, or simply masking an entire marker. In the upcoming chapter we learn some tricks when it comes to stereo tracking. Many artists fear the double amount of work since obviously all tracking points have to be tracked in two cameras. But 3D Equalizer 4 is equipped with some scripts, helping here to reduce the amount of tracking work and quality control. So, let's start. Here we have a shot of a camera moving a bit forward. Both eyes are already set up with the respective setting in Attribute Editor. ASXR is able to provide both shots in a single file, and in 3D4 it is possible to define if a camera, with such an image sequence imported, shows the right or left eye. Further, both cameras are already synced to each other. The existing grade points will matter a bit later. By the way, a quick tip. Shortcut Enter quickly changes the current camera, making it possible to switch it from left to right eye and vice versa. A very helpful feature that's used tons of times in a stereo project. Alright, start tracking. How about this red light looking like a descendant of HAL 9000? Here 
we can apply some of the tracking tricks we already learned at the beginning. Make sure pattern area just covers the flat surface around the light, not any green screen and parts of the door with a different Z depth, as well as rotating the tracking box. Nice, start tracking. Looks good. A quick check. Yes, everything's perfect. On to the right eye. First problem is where to place the point. Of course, we can get an approximately correct point position, but alternating both cameras reveals pretty clearly it's not precise enough. Would be nice aligning the point to the keyframe in left camera like we've done earlier with script align to key or align to reference pattern. These scripts cannot help here since they only take frames from the point's own tracking curve into account, not from one in another camera. Luckily, there's a script. Match point to other stereo camera in menu tracking. And the label tells us exactly what it's doing, so simply run it. Nice, it even copied the tracking box rotation from the left camera. A quick check in both cameras. Great, we can continue tracking this point. So, we can align points of other cameras, but still have to track these points manually here. Well, luckily again, there's another script for that task as well. Track homologous stereo points. And the best part of it, this script can track multiple points at the same time as well. So let's set these gray points here to visible, revealing that they are tracked in the left eye camera. Best conditions to demonstrate this awesome script. Open the script and have a look at the provided parameters. First, we can set which points should be tracked. We stay with all possible points since not all are selected. Next, these points should be tracked in the secondary camera, the right eye in this project. They are already tracked in the primary, the left eye, which happens to be the current one as well. The other parameters can be left at their default settings. Most of them are already familiar since they are exactly the same as in Attribute Editor. Just the last three are different, defining if the tracking box should be changed in secondary camera. But here, we leave them as they are as well. So everything's set up. Then track all points. Of course, tracking multiple points take a bit more time than just a single one, but it's still faster than tracking each point individually. A quick check. Great. Tracking quality is the same as the manual approach. As seen in this chapter, tracking stereo projects doesn't have to be the double amount of tracking work. Feel free to explore these tools whenever you encounter a stereo shot. Probably this does put a smile on your face from now on. Okay, okay. That's it with part two. Boy. What a crazy amount of tools and techniques did we learn. All parameters in Attribute Editor, like weights, blurring, defining reference patterns, rotating and scaling reference patterns. Then of course, great techniques like offset tracking and amazing tools like insert track, deform track and the overlay grid. We could explore image controls and its powerful options for enhancing or modifying an image until it fits our needs. And last but not least, taking the fear away from stereo tracking with some helpful scripts. Like already demonstrated, basically the single most important thing you can take away from this course is obviously knowing about these tools and features, and more importantly, always, really always be curious enough to combine different tools and techniques. It's surprising how many complex and difficult situations can be solved with this approach. And this is also one thing making 3D Equalizer 4 so great and successful. Combining amazing and powerful scripts and tools so individually and tailored to every need of an artist. There is simply no one default state or just one way to do it. A great artist wouldn't like to work this way anyway, because it would limit the possibilities and creativity. Okay, chapter 3 is a little showcase of exactly this. 
how to track a quite hard feature combining different tools and techniques we learned in the last two parts. So, get popcorn, get on a comfort seat and enjoy the show. Hopefully. See you in a bit. <laughs>